All right, everybody, welcome back to another Twin Peaks episode review. This is episode five of season three. And I'd like to say before starting that, uh, yeah, overall, a good episode. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, solid. Um, glad I was having a little bit of doubts in the last couple episodes, just as the overall flow of things, but we've gotten back on track. Things are, are heading in the direction that I hoped that they would. Um, so it, Definitely uh, you know, encouraging, um, kind of reinforces the notion that Lynch does still know what he's doing, um, even though he had to uh, kind of set some groundwork in the in some of the uh, previous uh, last episodes, particularly three and four, you know, with all the, the Dougie Jones stuff, um, which I'm sure some people were kind of bored with, um, that we're expecting uh, us to just go back to Twin Peaks and spend all of our time in Twin Peaks, but that's... Uh, not pr probably everything that happens is it's uh, we're, we're heading out hanging out in South Dakota as well because that's uh, our other uh, spot of a lot of activity so I'm sure the two uh, storylines will intersect at some point uh, but anyway yeah uh, let's get started so we start out uh, we've got uh, an aerial shot of Vegas looks like um, we've got a gal uh, on the on a uh, phone conference call or something with the looks like the two guys that were initially going to assassinate Dougie. Um, we see the RR sign on the uh, wall, which is Rancho Rosa, which I guess is the uh, housing development or something where Dougie's at. Um, she's a bit frazzled. Um, the job needs to be done. So I'm assuming that perhaps she's the, uh, the contact. Um, with uh, whoever has set up the job, perhaps. And remember, there was another uh, guy in, in one of the casinos earlier that mentioned something about, you know, never wanting to do business with this kind of person. And that guy was actually, uh, um, I think that was either, I think that was might have been the beginning of episode two. Um, but yeah, he was the actor that was in Mulholland Drive um, that uh, is in the scene where he Talk. He meets a guy at a diner to tell them that he's had a dream about the place um, that he's currently at, and so on and so forth. So, I won't spoil that part of the of Mall and Drive. You haven't seen it, but he is he is from that uh, an actor that played a small part in that movie. So she takes out a rather archaic BlackBerry uh, and sends a message um, to, that says is says Argent, um, and then followed by the number two. Um. We see that this causes a some kind of metal box that's sitting in the center of this wooden bowl um, to blink two red lights. So I'm assuming that's what the number two was for. So there, that was the uh, contact, and that was the um, the message was to that causes blink uh, lights to blink. So kind of weird. <laughs> Not quite sure to make of that from the beginning. Um, now we're over at the morgue, and obviously the cause of death of the drifter's body um, was decapitation. Um, and she's uh, cracking some jokes, the uh, the pathologist cracking some jokes with the guys, and then eventually gets to the point where um, the ring, Dougie's wedding ring, was actually found in the stomach of the uh, John Doe. Um, so yeah, we do now have a connection of sorts with um, the Dougie doppelganger. And the murder uh, at the uh, apartment complex um, involving the principal, who we know's wife was killed by Bob. Um, Bob is waiting patiently in prison in the next scene. Um, kind of in a dilemma because in the past he could cut, he could, you know, you know, what do you pull that ripcord or whatever he said, you know, like with uh, Leland and get the heck out, out of town. Um, but now that's getting out of town means headed, heading back to the lodge possibly. And he can't, <laughs> can't do that because that's the last place he wants to go. So a little irony here. He goes to look in the mirror after his uh, food arrives and we get a flashback of that, uh, scene at the end of, uh, season two with, uh, Doppelganger Dale and Bob kind of have, sharing a kind of a maniacal psychotic laugh together. And we also see the uh, scene where we first realize that Dale has been possessed by Bob with the when he headbutts the mirror in his uh, room at the Great Northern. Um, yeah, so uh, we this brings us to the a uh, interesting comment where we almost see like a uh, 
the face in the mirror of, you know, doppelganger Dale, um, something almost is like comes over it wrote and you see like almost a just or some kind of om something o superimposed over the face so there's just some um, a slight hint of something else there and then and then uh doppelganger says you're still with me that's good um so from this i can assume that basically uh dopper doppelganger dale uh for i guess a is the easiest way to uh call him um is basically in i guess in charge most of the time um, Bob is still riding shotgun. Um, so I guess I, I, um, I'm not sure quite how that works because the doppelganger obviously is the evil dark side, the shadow self of Dale. So the, the darker, uh, um, parts of the human mind and the appetites and so forth. So I guess, uh, he's allowed to do the more of the mundane stuff and perhaps Bob comes out to play every once in a while. So I'm not, not quite sure how that works out. But uh, apparently, yes, he's glad that he's still with him because perhaps uh, might need to call on Bob to, uh, to do something for him. Uh, yeah, and then we get the next scene. We get Mike, uh, the Twin Peaks jock uh, that Nadine was uh, hot for when she was uh, had hit her head a little too hard and uh, decided that she was uh, an 18 year old again back in high school. Is uh, apparently an office suit now, and uh, some slacker comes in. Uh, uh, to for an interview apparently and Mike uh, chastises him and uh, kicks him out. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, and Twin Peaks Sheriff's Office. Uh, Lucy is relaying messages like she always does. Uh, the, the sheriff, <laughs> as as the sheriff's wife is uh, heading down the hall to the room he's in, she's letting him know play by play where she where the wife is headed. Good old Lucy. Uh, yeah. Long story short, uh, Frank's wife is annoying as hell. And just a reminder, don't get married, folks. Don't get married. Uh, Sonny Jim. Great name that family has. You got uh, Janie E., Dougie, uh, Sonny Jim. Hmm. Uh, Dougie Cooper, as I'll refer to him now, uh, with his uh, avocado suit. Um, he looks at Sonny Jim and starts to tear up a little bit for some reason. Not quite sure what the significance of that is. Uh, yeah, there's that R&R &R for Rancho Rosa kick-ass looking Chevelle again and uh, Dougie's uh, Mo Dougie mobile hasn't blown up yet and right on the tail of or seemingly on the tail of the uh, charger is a or not charger of a uh, the Chevelle is a either black charger or challenger I'm not sure uh, I can't differentiate based it looks like they uh, use a uh, kind of a custom job for that since the badges i imagine they had to remove the the uh, badges that signify the uh the make and brand and stuff in order to use it or maybe they had to pay money to dodge or something but it is a mopar muscle car of some type either a charger or a challenger interesting music playing there uh, anybody know the band that's music's playing in the car it's uh, kind of interesting um, Dougie Cooper at work, uh, or at least outside the office, sees a statue that I am going to go out on a limb and say looks a l little bit like Sheriff Harry S. Truman, and that is why it catches his eye initially. I think it does kind of look like Sheriff Truman. I'm sure that maybe after another s historical figure, who knows, it's South Dakota, I'm not aware of the history, so that is what popped in my head the minute I saw it. Um, so, uh, he follows the direction the gun is pointing. And again, thank goodness for uh, helpful co-workers and acquaintances that are there to <laughs> help Dougie out. I wonder if he's had one of these uh, strange episodes before. Um, of course, Cooper, uh, Dougie Cooper, that is, he's the uh, coffee makes a bean line for it. Damn good Joe. So apparently he, uh, this Dougie works for an insurance company. And uh, long story short here, the uh, corporate suits are a bunch of douches, of course. And, uh, for some reason, Cooper, uh, calls his co-worker a liar during the meeting. That doesn't go over well at all. And when he is, um, brought, uh, into the boss's office to be reprimanded, he hears the word agent. And it's obvious that, uh, that word is, starts to trigger some memories, as does the, uh, mention of, or the, the when he is given the files, he, he mentions case files. So little by little, it, it seems like, um... Cooper's memory is being restored either on its of its own volition or by certain words that are, are triggering his uh, his memories. 
Uh, and then uh, apparently he, either he does not remember how going to the bathroom works or he cannot find the bathroom. And by the look on that lady's face, I wonder if she was uh, intimate with Dougie. We see some casino footage um, at the uh, location where Dougie Cooper, a.k.a. Mr. Jackpots, um, had some uh, some big wins. And uh, apparently somebody's in, in deep trouble. Oh, hey there, Jim Belushi. How's it going? Uh, 425k isn't really that much for a casino to lose, but I guess the, given the circumstances, <laughs> there is a uh, potential uh, cause for concern that somebody is uh, working an inside job. Um, but yeah, I guess Mr. Big Shot there doesn't uh, disagree disagrees that the 425k isn't a chump change. Um, and, uh, Jim Belushi, apparently a man of few words. And it was, is it just me or does he kind of look like Alex Jones during that shot? <laughs> For some reason when he was saying, you know, don't, you know, leave town, don't come back. He, I don't know, kind of look like Alex Jones. Um, the Dougie Love Mobile is still intact. Junkie Mom, uh, should be looking after her kid. Which, and, uh, I'm wondering if it's just me, but it seemed like, is this... Neighborhoods look similar to something we saw in like Breaking Bad. I was it? I wonder if this was shot in a similar location. I know it wasn't Breaking Bad. It's supposed to be like New Mexico or something like that. It just instantly reminded me of the same neighborhood. Um, yeah. So uh, a bit of deja vu there. Uh, Black Mopar pulls up, and uh, petty car thieves are going to go kaboom. So thankfully, the little kid didn't end up uh, getting um, getting uh, turned into barbecue. But uh, I guess those guys in the black Mopar were just maybe just car thieves canvassing the place. Um, oh, or, but then again, that's kind of a crappy car, and uh, why they would steal it in broad daylight makes no sense. So I'm assuming that there's still a connection between the guys in the Chevelle and them, but we'll have to see. And uh, speaking of Breaking Bad, <laughs> there's a car wash. Uh, same car wash? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, Jade uh, has the key for Dale Cooper, room 315 at the Great Northern. So it'll be interesting, um, since she, I'm assuming she's putting it in the mail, and then they'll end up getting it. Maybe that'll, uh, maybe that's something that they were missing or, or need to look for. Is the key. Maybe once that shows up, they'll uh, there'll be something in the room, perhaps, or... We don't know, but uh, th the number 315 got him into the world as far as uh, leaving the Black Lodge goes uh, through that kind of magic electronic uh, power outlet <laughs> on the wall, that goofy thing that sent him through. So 315's got something to do with maybe getting him back to Twin Peaks. We'll have to see. Hey, and lo and behold, it's Norma Jennings. Long time no see. Uh, yeah, I need to go visit that restaurant uh, sometime and have some pie and coffee. It's been I, I've been I've been there once, but it was so long ago. I probably was probably just a kid when I was there. So uh, be interesting to see if what it looks like. Uh, I'm sure they got plenty of tourists day in and day out showing up, take pictures and all that good stuff. Yeah, Toad. Uh, if you recall, Toad was a kind of a truck driver guy, big fat guy, and uh, now he's uh, apparently lost a whole lot of weight. <laughs> so. I guess he went on a diet. Um, a new blonde shows up at uh, the Double R to talk with Shelly. Uh, Shelly gives her some money um, while Norma watches. A uh, young blonde looks to be in a bit of trouble or some kind. Uh, and look, it's the uh, slacker uh, loser from the job interview trying to be Burt Reynolds in his Firebird Trans Am. <laughs> Uh, maybe this guy is a meth addict or something. That kind of what it reminds me of. Um, after uh, Norma and uh, Shelly start talking, I assume this is Shelly's daughter. And Machen Amick looks really good, by the way. Uh, she's aged very well. Uh, so yeah, apparently if this is Shelly's daughter, uh, maybe Shelly's and Bobby's daughter. You never know. Um... Is hooked up with this kind of ginger junkie douchebag looking guy. Um, and we see that scene, you know, kind of where, uh, Shel where, the, where the blonde gets in the car with the, the guy. And it, I don't know if this is supposed to be kind of a mirror of Bobby and Shelly as they were back in 1990. In Bobby's uh, car, I can't remember what he drove. 
you know, uh, except for they were, uh, weren't uh, junkies. They were just, uh, you know, doing a, drinking from a flask, I guess. Um, so yeah, maybe uh, it's to show that times uh, doesn't you know doesn't change much uh, where uh, Twin Peaks is concerned. Uh, yeah, and the two of them, uh, the new generation, are either uh, doing some cocaine or possibly heroin. It does, I don't know if they if he mentioned a street drug name for it or if it was mentioned at all. Seattle does have heroin problems currently, but cocaine is the classic Twin Peaks drug of choice. If we're going for a lore um, style uh, uh, content, I guess you could say. Uh, yeah, so, and this is a perfect example of why I detest junkies, and they're at the top of my list of some of the most hated people on this planet for me personally. Uh, closing time at the insurance agency. Uh, I hope uh, for Dougie Cooper's sake he isn't planning on uh, going back to the casino. And he stares at the statue for quite a while. Um, the statue which I do believe, at least at the moment, that he is making a mental connection with Sheriff Truman. Um, the mental image. Um, and then we bounce over to the sheriff's office. Coincidence? Maybe. Maybe not. And man, do I want donuts. But it sucks that I can't have any. Sucks trying to eat healthy, but man, don't, I don't know what it is. Coffee and donuts seems almost like a... Uh, must have when you're when you're watching Twin Peaks. Uh, Hawk and Andy sifting through some paperwork. Um, apparently looking, for, <laughs> Andy's apparently looking for Indians. But uh, yeah, Hawk has learned to uh, tolerate Andy's kind of stupidity over all these years. <laughs> Andy doesn't change. Lucy doesn't change. Twin Peaks doesn't change much apparently. Oh yeah, now we got Doctor Jacoby, uh, and apparently he is now his. Uh, Joined the modern age of uh, media or social media um, contribution, and he's got his own uh, kind of conspiracy truther type channel. Did I mention Alex Jones earlier? And he does indeed. Dr. Jacoby has a cosmic flashlight that he is going to use to red pill the world. And look who are his fans it's uh, Jerry Horn and Nadine Hurley. Uh, now we get to see where those shovels came in that uh, we he was delivered at the uh, the first episode of the show, which was kind of weird. Then we saw him pr spraying them. Additionally weird. But uh, apparently these are golden shovels to get you, to dig you out of the shit you're in with uh, how crazy and uh, insane the world has become. <laughs> Nadine, she has that same stupid look on her face like when she was watching uh, Invitation to Love. <laughs> God, geez. And uh, I think Jerry just tunes in because he's high all the time probably now. So Dr. Jacoby is an entrepreneur. He's selling golden shovels uh, to get yourself out of the shit uh, for $29.99. Dr. Amps. <laughs> that's, that's an awesome segment. That's a totally perfect, uh, uh, you know, of lampooning or satiring of uh, the online or YouTube truth or conspiracy theory type stuff. Not to say all of it's hokey, but it that is a, a very good... Uh, depiction of it oh uh, that's a great scene i imagine i would love to see um people put that up just by itself um it's yeah it's a great great little uh moment there for dr jacoby and at naval headquarters uh one of the officers tells her superior that um another hit uh on Prince for Major Garland Briggs has come up, and apparently this is the 16th time um, a hit for his particular prince has come up through a, a law enforcement database. Uh, 16th time in 25 years. So, uh, that, that brings up some interesting questions. In Buckhorn, South Dakota, where uh, all the fun is being held currently, or is happening currently, uh, is where the, uh, the hit has come from, and... FBI is in the neighborhood, at least currently. Um, so, uh, remember, this brings back the uh, scene where the in the previous episode that where the uh, fingerprints required a military access to acquire. So now we know that uh, now the Navy is going to get involved and send uh, somebody down there to check it out. Uh, yeah, so apparently these uh, fingerprints of Major Briggs were found at the scene of the crime where that uh, decapitated body was. Which is interesting because Bobby 
in the previous episode mentioned that his dad had passed away and that Agent Cooper had visited him um, right before his passing. So possibly that was Doppelganger Cooper with Bob. They um, perhaps Major Briggs died uh, um, in a not so nice fashion. And his fingerprints were lifted or somehow used uh, for this reason. Or, you know, that would be my, uh, within the realm of possibility without the supernatural getting involved. But we'll have to see. Like I said, 16 times during the 25 previous years that his fingerprints have shown up in a database search um, by local or regional or state or federal law enforcement. So, yeah. And uh, I guess the previous times it's not... It's ended up not being anything like they, you know, they keep saying it. If, it's, if it is what it is, but, you know, but if it isn't, you know, but if it is, <laughs> make sure to get in contact with the FBI. So let's assume that this is one of the times where the uh, fingerprints are relevant. So cool stuff. Uh, Roadhouse uh, time, though not the uh, closing track for the episode. A little bluesy rock for you. Yeah, the saxophone kind of ruins it, if you ask me. But not as bad as the freeform saxophone stuff in Lost Highway that Bill Pullman was doing. He he's uh, apparently work, you know, is a uh, plays as a jazz musician at some you know nightclub in in Lost Highway, and he's just noodling on the saxophone. And yeah, it's really annoying. Um, some douchebag lounge lizards sitting around smoking in a non-smoking zone. And I don't know if the uh, guy that comes up to tell him to uh, knock it off is the owner or just one of the bartenders, but uh, he uh, puts on the tough guy role um, in order to oppress the uh, local gals. And uh, one somebody else uh, man walks by, and uh, I'm probably a, a bouncer or something at, at the place, and gets the uh, full pack of cigarettes, but uh, uh, appearing to have a, put the uh, ruffian in his place for being disrespectful at the roadhouse. But nah, he's just passing money along. So, this leads me to believe that the uh, Twin Peaks drug trade, perhaps via Canada, is once again back in business with a new generation of children to prey upon. I wonder, and I, this guy didn't have a goofy accent, so I don't, I don't want to say that his last name might be Renault, but you never know, it may be a Renault. And, uh, yes, young girls uh, apparently like bad boys, but uh, I don't think this bad boy could fight his way out of a paper bag. And he just looks like a you know, little scumbag moron, treating women like crap, of course. So, I wouldn't be surprised if this guy um, is hooking up the uh, local youth with the drugs. Perhaps Shelly's uh, daughter or daughter's uh, boyfriend is getting drugs from this guy. It's a, po it's a possibility. He, in the, uh, I think the first episode, was sitting at the bar at the roadhouse at the end and looking over at Shelly. Um, may have even motioned to her. So, uh, who knows who this guy is. Alright, so now we're uh, back in uh, South Dakota. And Agent Preston's looking over some, uh, assuming it's South Dakota, is looking at some old photos, of or an old photograph of Dale Cooper. Comparing it with the mugshot. And doing some fingerprint examining. So I wonder if she will uh, get uh, Major Briggs's uh, fingerprint stuff as well, and and do her own uh, look look into the in the uh, files um, from and previous records. And maybe she'll be able to give us some information on what's happened to Major Briggs if the representative of the of the Navy doesn't uh, in the upcoming episode or episodes. Um, Bob gets his phone call. Though he knows he's being spied upon, um, so he decides to play around. He mentions a Mr. Strawberry, uh, and apparently the warden doesn't like that much. So I don't know if he, if Bob, I'm assuming, has kind of come to the forefront now into the, dop in the, into the doppelganger, has taken the back seat. Because uh, Bob seems to know information about people um, like he knew about. Remember, he knew about um, what happened to Cooper in Pittsburgh when uh, Leland was being in Leland with Bob in control of him was being uh, interrogated by um, Dale when and the final scene before uh, Leland dies. So maybe Mr. Strawberry is a mention of somebody that's connected to the warden, that the warden is up to no good, that uh, he doesn't uh, want 
uh, people finding out because he's out of the three in that room. He's the only one that seemed to uh, react when that mention was the name was mentioned. Um, Bob dials a crap load of numbers and somehow the alarms go off and everything's going, you know, crazy in the uh, prison, you know, alarms, the cameras and everything. And then, uh, Bob mentioned, says to the, on the phone, the cow jumped over the moon. <laughs> I don't know if that's supposed to be a code word or something go just goofy. He said, um, and then he sh sets the phone down and everything goes back to normal. And this is probably why uh, Doppelganger is glad that Bob is still with him, because it looks like perhaps a little uh, trickery of the supernatural just took place, or at least what is within the power of the uh, spirits of the Lodge to, to do. Because electricity, remember? Electricity plays a part in all of this. Um, we go then um, back to that box that we saw in the beginning with the two red lights sitting in the bowl. Um, the lights blink, and then the box vanishes leaving behind what looks to be like a piece of metal, which is interesting because when Dougie's, uh, dop the doppelganger Dougie imploded into itself, we were left with what, a little spherical piece of gold, like a bear, like a ball bearing type looking thing. And this is, looks to be a piece of metal though, not in the same shape. So we've got another, uh, gadget of some sorts that's, uh, got a supernatural, um, uh, component to it that perhaps was linked with um, what took place in the prison. I think there's this direct connection. So yeah, um, interesting. We get some uh, nostalgic Twin Peaks jazz to finish off the scene. Um, Dougie Cooper is still staring at the statue of who I believe is he thinks, or at least in the, his uh, the back of his mind, he is uh, associating with uh, Sheriff Harry S. Truman. So yeah, it was a good episode overall. I think uh, we're getting clues and things laid along the way through the the stuff that's we're not used to. You know, the Dougie Cooper type stuff, which you know could it's it's interesting. There, it is being it's serving a purpose. You know, it's so when things come across as seeming like filler, it gets it puts a bad taste in your in our mouths. But uh, I think that um, the pacing and everything is looking just fine, especially with some of the new stuff that was revealed with Bob. That um, that box mechanism thing, um, what happened in the prison, um, the main, the mention of, uh, Major Briggs' um, fingerprints and so on. So yeah, I think we're headed in, we're, we're in the right direction. Um, so yeah, looking good. Um, I'm looking forward to the next episode. It is going to air on June 11th. And when it does, I will have another uh, episode review for you, uh, that following Monday. Until then, everybody take it easy.